I'm Dan, I'm the CTO at Heap. This talk is called Understanding Auto Vacuum. It's about vacuums, why they need to exist, what they're for, how they work under the hood, that sort of thing. Uh, a little bit about me, I joined Heap three and a half years ago as the first hire. Uh, I've worked on basically everything in the back end side of the product, how the data gets captured, how it gets ingested, um, how it gets queried, how it's laid out, all that stuff. Before that, I was a back-end engineer at Palantir where I worked on uh, deployability type stuff and all sorts of general back-end things. And before that, I was at Stanford where I studied math and computer science and did a bunch of deep learning type stuff. So um, first, we're going to dive into how Postgres concurrency works in general, which is why something like auto vacuum needs to exist in the first place. If you've used Postgres before but aren't very familiar with the internals or how it works, uh, this should level up your understanding on, of what's going on under the hood. Next, we'll walk through the specifics of what vacuum processes do and how the auto vacuum daemon orchestrates all of those. Uh, then we'll walk through how I generally think about tuning these things. There's a lot of different workload specific things that you will want to configure to make this work well for you. And at the end, I'll walk through a case study uh, from a year ago at Heap, or really two years ago at Heap, in which we had a totally pathological worst case scenario for vacuums and um, sort of like how, how we dealt with that. So um, MVCC is Postgres's approach to, Postgres and basically every modern uh, relational DB uh, works the same way, which is they use this technology called uh, MVCC, which is multi-version concur concurrency control. So uh, you need some way when you're building uh, an asset database to keep the transactions consistent and isolated when you have consistent reads and writes going on. Um, you could do this with locks. This is not a great way to do this because if you have, for example, a long-running read, uh, it will block all writes to the things that it touches. Or if you have a long-running write, it will block reads this turns out to be uh, not a great way to build databases. So uh, this is where MVCC comes in. Um, the idea of MVCC is to store multiple different versions of every row, and then on each version, you store when it became visible and when it stops becoming visible, if it stops becoming visible. So I'll go, I'll go through a concrete example of the table. So let's take a hypothetical table where we, there have been two transactions. The first one inserted a 10, the second one inserted a 20 and a 30. Um, when you query the table, uh, you get all three of those values and check that, uh, that transaction one for the first row and transactions two, in, two, transaction two for the second and third row were committed. And then you display the results because they're all visible to you because your transaction ID is gonna be higher than those. Um, under the hood, these, you can actually query these columns in a regular vanilla Postgres database if you're just curious how this stuff works. Um, so the way Postgres implements a delete is to just set the X max on a row to the current transaction, and then any future transactions will see that it was deleted in the past and thus is no longer visible. So let's say we want to delete where the value is equal to 10. Um, if our current transaction is transaction three, we'll set the X max on that row to three, and uh, if we run a selection again on the table, like we'll check three and see that it was a transaction that was committed and then we'll ignore that row because it's not visible anymore. So let's say we also wanna do an update. Let's say we update and set val equal to val plus one. Uh, it works basically the way you'd think. There's, it, there's a delete and an insert basically glued together. There's a, the deletion component where we set the x max to four on the two previous rows, which is our new transaction ID. Uh, and then we insert two new rows at the bottom that have the same ID. So um, at, at no point did we actually need to lock anything or block readers from, from accessing the table. Um, so like in short, the point of MVCC is that reads don't block writes and writes don't block reads. Um, but one of the costs you might have noticed is that at no point in any of this did we actually delete anything. We marked things as no longer visible by setting an X max, but we never cleaned anything up. So no space was ever actually released to the OS. So if you just do a lot of updates and deletes, your table, unless you do some kind of maintenance, your table will grow indefinitely. This is uh, often referred to as MVCC bloat. So 
you need some way of cleaning this stuff up, both for performance reasons, because having a bunch of junk in your table that's not visible slows things down, and also for like fundamental limitations reasons, because you probably have a finite amount of disk space, and if you have a small or even a large data set, you don't want it taking up 10 times as much space on disk with all kinds of dead rows that aren't really visible to anything. Um, I should also mention uh, this, these MVCC details are where a lot of Postgres' uh, performance characteristics come from, especially the surprising ones. If you find yourself ever wondering why something takes a really long time, really short time in a surprising sort of way, this is often the explanation. This is also why the, if you, if you think about the transaction isolation rules and why they're the way they are, it's usually something to do with, like, if you think about them in, in terms of MVCC and how this stuff is laid out, you'll probably understand. Uh, for example, a lot of people are often surprised that rolling back a really long transaction is free. That's not the case in all kinds of, in all databases. Uh, and that's because you don't actually need to clean anything up. You can leave behind whatever garbage that you wrote, and you can leave behind X maxes that you wrote that your current transaction. And if you just mark your transaction as not committed, then a future reader will, will see it as, like, you, you don't actually have to do anything. You can just say it's not committed. You don't have to like, change the stuff that you already wrote to the table space. Um, another thing that you, is a little subtler, but it's a, is a problem with a naive implementation of this, is that um, those xmin and xmax transaction IDs are 32-bit. Um, so 2 to 32 is about 4 billion, and if you want to do more than 4 billion transactions without doing any maintenance, you're going to have some kind of integer overflow issue where you go back around to 1 and... Uh, all of a sudden, things that were in the past of you look like they're way in the future, and things that were, are in your future actually look like they're way in the past, and everything's else. Like, un unknown corruption like, results from that. This is called an XID wraparound. Uh, XID is transaction ID. You may have seen this string when running. Uh, you, may, you may have seen queries that say auto vacuum to prevent wraparound. That's what this is. I'll get into that in plain detail later in this. Um, you might be asking yourself, why are these 32 bits instead of 64 bits? I think that's a wonderful question. Um, my personal understanding is that it's mostly a historical thing. This was, I think, set a long time ago when four billion transactions was a lot of transactions. Uh, and uh, the extra eight bytes per row was a lot of bytes. Uh, personally, if I could wave a magic wand and make these be 64 bit instead of 32 bit, I would gladly pay eight bytes per row to never have to ever think about this. Um, I, I'm under the impression that changing, it's like pretty core into the database, so it's not something you can change in like a pretty simple pull request. So it's probably just kind of gonna be this way forever. Um, just to give you some kind of frame of reference, if you're doing 20 transactions per second, that's about seven years before you hit two to the 32, which is not an, that, like you probably have a database that you want to last more than seven years. So these are 32 bit, there's some finite thing there, you have to get around these limits somehow. That's another thing that AutoVacuum is for. So this is the problem statement of auto vacuums. We need some way to clean up these dead versions of rows, both for space reasons and for performance reasons. Uh, we need some sort of solution to this XID wraparound problem. And while we're at it, we're, if we're doing table maintenance, there's other performance improving sort of stuff that we can do. So this is what vacuum is for, this is what it does. Um, does all this generally make sense so far? Like what the problem is we're trying to solve? So um, let's start with the dead versions of rows and what we do with that. So the solution is uh, pretty simple once you think about it in these terms. Um, a vacuum process will scan through your table and uh, it's keeping track of what the, the lowest active transaction ID is of all the current users of the database. And we just go through the table looking for rows that were deleted before any of those transactions started. So those are rows that are not visible to any active transaction and they will never become visible again unless we have some kind of integer overflow. They, they never should become visible again. So we just scan through the table looking for transactions or rows that were deleted a long time ago where the transaction was committed, of course. Um, and we add them to this data structure called the free space map. The free space map is the internal thing in Postgres that keeps track of places like this that we can safely overwrite because they contain data that's never going to be visible to future readers. Uh, and as an aside, the way the free space map works under the hood is super cool. It's totally worth reading about or come grab me after we can talk about it. Um, anyway, you keep track of places where you can write stuff in the future, and then 
next, you know, a couple transactions later when we do an insert, the first thing we do is check the free space map to see if there's a place we can insert this that's already in the table, and we'll just reuse that space. So if we do some insert here, uh, we'll put it uh, in a previously used spot instead of growing the table at the bottom. Yeah, you had a question. It's a tree where, oh, the question was like, how generally does the free space map work? It's a tree um, in which the leaf nodes point to positions and have the size of the contiguous sp spot and then the inner nodes are the max of the children. So you can look at the top of the tree and uh, immediately know if you need to extend the table or not because it'll tell you the biggest spot in the table. There's all kinds of other clever tricks. It's actually not wall logged, uh, so making that safe is like, yeah, it's cool. We can talk about it later if you're curious. Uh, anyway, this is the basic idea of the free space map. We, we mark places that we can reuse in the future and then we reuse them in the future. Um, so uh, you also need to, at some point, remove dead rows from indexes. Uh, the way we do that is we keep track of all of these rows that we're marking as never going to be visible in the future again and then we batch a bunch of those up and scan through the indexes and remove them. You might be familiar with the fact that Postgres does not store row visibility stuff in indexes. So uh, indexes can point to stuff, they're allowed to point to stuff that is not visible anymore. So you also have to go through indexes and remove these things as well. Um, and a particular problem that we've run into that I'll talk a little bit more about later is that uh, you, you may have already figured this out. If you have a single really long running transaction, all this breaks because you can't guarantee that that transaction won't view the rows that you're trying to mark as never going to be viewed again. So if I wanted to be completely pathological and just run, if I just leave a transaction open, for example, if I log in your database and run begin and never commit it, um, your vacuums will never do anything. They'll read the table indefinitely and never actually mark a row as dead. You, you had a question? Uh, the question was, uh, in Postgres, every statement is a transaction. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I mean, if you have a really long read or an accidental left open transaction, um, the exception to this is other vacuums. Postgres is smart enough to realize that another vacuum doesn't count. So if you, that, that's kind of the only exception, at least that I know of. Make sense? Um, you may have noticed we're still not deleting anything. Uh, so this is maybe the most common question I hear people asking about, auto vac about vacuums. Is I'm running vacuum and the table isn't shrinking. We didn't delete anything. All we did was stop future growth of the table. So that's all this does. If you really need to delete stuff, that's where this uh, vacuum full option comes in. You may have seen that as well. What vacuum full does is lock the table completely and compact it in place and then release a bunch of space at the end. Um, it has the serious drawback of locking the table to all reads and writes, so you can't use the table at all while you're doing this. Um, you basically should never be doing this as a regular maintenance operation. Um, if you're in sort of an emergency, you might need to, like you're gonna incur some downtime as a result. Uh, there's also this tool, PG Repack, that you, that you can look up. Um, it's a tool, sort of like vacuum full, that you can use in a pinch. Basically, it writes a second version of the table uh, and sets up some triggers so that you can write to the table and it'll, it'll show up in the new table. It's sort of like vacuum full, but you can write and read from the table at the same time. Um, it has the downside that you need, two, you need two times as much space as the table because you're writing a second version of it. So if you're in the kind of pinch where you have like 98% disk fullness and you really need to, like it's too late for that. Um, you're gonna need to take some downtime. So that's how we deal with the dead versions of rows problem in general. Um, another sort of main thing we're trying to fix here is this problem of uh, finite space of transaction IDs and how to make the database uh, still work after four, four billion transactions. So to explain how this works, um, we need to get a little bit deeper into how transaction IDs work under the hood. Um, Let's imagine them as a ring where when you go around from two to 32 minus one, you go back to zero and one and two again. Um, if we implemented transactions the 
totally naive way and just incremented and did regular unsigned int comparisons, uh, you would get the issues that you already know about where you hit some kind of overflow. Um, Postgres' solution this is really elegant. It's basically to, for each transaction, take half the ring that's ahead of you and treat it as the future and half the ring that's behind you and treat it as the past. So let's say we're transaction two. Um, everything from two through, uh, I guess, two to the 31 plus two, that'd be some off by one thing. The, the half a ring that's ahead of me, I treat as the future. And the half a ring that's behind me, I treat as the past. And uh, I still have this problem, which is that um, I, I've just kind of rotated the same problem, which is that anything that I think is the future, if I have gone more than halfway around the circle, has already happened in the past. Does that make sense? Like if I'm on our, our second time around the circle, then uh, and transaction three was used before, I think that's in the future of me, but that was actually in the past, so that doesn't really work. So um, to, sol to solve this, the, the trick Postgres uses is if something was committed a really long time ago, we replace the transaction ID with this special value called frozen XID, which is sort of like negative infinity for transaction IDs. Um, so if I ever am going through a table and I see this special frozen XID, I, know, I just know that was in the past of me. I know this row was either added or deleted or both um, before, before me. Um, just to be clear, you're not actually freezing, a common misconception is that freezes the concepts, the contents of the row, you can still update it after. It just freezes the, um, the transaction ID in the row version so we can reuse it. So basically, um, what, what we're trying to do is uh, freeze, like keep a horizon of stuff that's a half circle away from me that's always frozen. So as, as, as I go forward from two to three, four, five, six, whatever, um, on, the other half, on the other end of the circle I need to be reclaiming old transaction IDs and freezing them. So I have some horizon I need to keep increasing so that I have transaction IDs always. So you can think of it as, um, I find I have some old transaction ID and I, I know it's really, really far in the past. Um, you replace the usage of it with this frozen X ID and now I can sort of reuse that number. It's kind of another way to think about it. So to show you in a sort of visual table way, um, let's take the table from the previous example um, we're scanning through the table, we do the same thing we are dealing with before where, let, let's say we're currently transaction a billion or something like that, so some, some way far in the future thing. Um, we know three and four were deleted a really long time ago, they'll never be visible again, so I put in the free space map. Um, and I also know that four was a really long time ago and will always be in the past for any future transaction. So um, you replace them with this frozen XID value and it's special and magic and now I can reuse that number four and I won't be confused. Does that generally make sense? So um, we go through the table, we freeze the old rows. Um, one important thing to note is that uh, cleaning up dead rows is optional but freezing things is not optional. Freezing things is mandatory. So this is maybe the second most common question or complaint I get which is I set auto vacuum equals off but it's still doing auto vacuums. You can't get around this. Even if you have a totally static data set and you're not changing anything, you're still creating new transaction IDs whenever you do a selection and you need, uh, like Postgres won't let you do that wraparound. That's a data corruption thing. In fact, if you get really close, uh, you'll start getting warnings on the command line when you run a query that you're close. And if you get really close, the data will shut down and you have to start it in some recovery mode to, to get your data back. You, basically, you start in recovery mode and do a vacuum and then it'll let you do it again. You had a question? So I couldn't. How can you see the uh, how many those are uh, yes or those are there and how uh, how the browsing is going on? Oh, oh, I think it's um, so the question was how do you like inspect the frozenness and stuff of the table? So a table keeps I'll get into this a little bit more later, but the TLDR is that a table keeps um, a metadata field called rel frozen ID. It's in PG class somewhere. Uh, that just keeps track of like what this horizon is and there's preferences I'll get into later for how close you're allowed to get to that before it does various degrees of freaking out or automatically doing stuff for you or whatever. So yeah, this is the thing you can't get around. You have, you have to freeze old things even if you're only doing reads. Make sense? Cool. So that's how we deal with the first two pieces of this, which are how do we clean up old dead versions of rows and 
how do we uh, deal with this XID wraparound thing? Um, while we're doing all these reads of a table, there's other performance improving stuff that we would like to do. Um, the one that you probably already know about is updating table statistics. So when you do a vacuum, a, a, a table will, Postgres keeps various uh, summary statistics on a table's contents, like uh, histograms of values for each column and sizes of tables and frequent values and that, that sort of thing, which it uses for the query planning. This is how it determines what kind of join to use or what order to do the joins or um, how, what, what kind of sort to use, whether you can do it in memory or not, that kind of thing. So uh, you know these statistics are estimates and they get out of date and a vacuum is doing a pretty huge scan of your table. It's a pretty good time to update that. So this is another thing vacuum does for you. Um, you had a question? The question was, does it do similar work as Analyze? And I think it does a superset of that in terms of query stats. I'm not actually positive. Did you cover Analyze? I'm pretty sure if you vacuum it, uh, you get the Analyze for free. It, it, it's similar work. Oh, you don't? It's separate. The, uh, the ability map updates by vacuum, but the table statistics are done by Analyze and this thing. Uh, vacuum doesn't update the table statistics. You need to do vacuum Analyze. And it doesn't. Don't you get yeah. some estimates from? That's true, you don't get the history of info, that's fair, because you're skipping a lot of contents. Yeah, so, um, that's fair. Uh, so, if you, if you want like a full um, statistics refresh, yeah, you need to do a vacuum analyze or just a regular analyze. Visibility map is totally separate. So, um, in addition, we uh, keep this structure around next to each table called the visibility map, which is uh, basically for each 8K block in a table, we keep two bits. One is for, uh, one is one, the first one is a visibility bit, which is one if every row in the block is visible to all future transactions. And the other is the frozen bit, which is one if all rows in this block are already frozen. So the visibility bit you use, uh, both of these you use in various cases in vacuum that I'll get into later. The most important non-vacuum use for these is uh, the visibility bit you can use if you're doing index-only scans. So an index-only scan is a scan in Postgres where actually you can answer your query with contents that are in the index. You don't actually need to read table data for it. But we still need to read visibility data from the table because we don't store visibility data in indexes. Um, so a, an index-only scan is a scan in which we get the data from the index and then check the table to see which of those rows is visible. Uh, but if you have this bit that's set for a lot of your rows, you can skip, or for a lot of your blocks, you can skip most of the blocks because you know any row in that block is visible. So this turns out to be a huge performance swing. Yeah. Uh, if your problem was solved by vacuuming, then it was probably related. I'm not sure. Um, no. no, really? Oh, I didn't know that. That makes sense. Um, well, I didn't know that. That's neat. Um, anyway, this is the point of the visibility map. It's only set during vacuums. It's a pretty important uh, performance improvement for this kind of workload. Um, that frozen bit in particular was only added in 9.6, which is a pretty big performance win if you have a large static or mostly static data set because you still have to do these freeze passes every now and then to uh, freeze old things. So being able to skip a large portion of the table as having all rows in most of the blocks frozen uh, means that the work is sort of accretive between runs. You don't, like, you don't have to re-vacuum the entire table. You only have to re-vacuum, you only have to vacuum stuff that was actually modified. So this, that's like an enormous performance benefit for certain kinds of workloads. So that's basically it for the performance improving maintenance aside from actually deleting or uh, restricting the growth of cruft in your DB, which slows it down. 
Um, those are the, the main three things that uh, we do here. So we're about halfway through a talk called Understanding Auto Vacuum, and you may be wondering when the auto part is going to come in. So auto vacuum is a process that kicks off vacuums for tables when it thinks they are overdue and manages those vacuums. That's about it. Um, so I'll get into some details about that. Um, so uh, there are a bunch of tunables here. Um, you want to control the IO impact of all this, which is like you don't want a bunch of vacuum processes, especially ones that are kicked off automatically to hose your perf really unexpectedly. Um, you want to bound or tune the memory use of these things because it affects how fast they run and also your memory use, which you sort of need to control. Uh, there are a bunch of trade-offs on the row freezing. I did a bunch of hand-waving in that and there's a bunch of specifics you can set. Um, and finally, you have this auto vacuum orchestration piece and you probably want to configure how it does those and when. So first, let's get into the IO impact piece. Um, there's two main Prefs here, the vacuum cost limit and the vacuum cost delay. The cost limit is a number of points of I.O. you're allowed to do before you have to do some kind of delay, and then the delay is how long is the delay. So your pseudocode for what a vacuum process does is something sort of like this. Like, you do some number of points, you sleep the uh, delay that you've set here, uh, and you, you continue until the table's done vacuuming. An important thing in particular to note is that that cost limit is global across your vacuum processes. So if, you're, if you run a bunch of different vacuums, they're eating from the same pool of points, um, which uh, is actually quite favorable for you because it means you can, um, you can just set this limit globally and run as many vacuums manually as you want and you don't have to worry that you're like, they're, they're just gonna eat from each other's uh, IO supply, but they're not gonna net hose you. Um, and of course, there are uh, auto vacuum equivalents for these prefs, so you can have a lower cost limit or a higher delay specific to auto vacuum. Um, this is something that you generally do want because uh, if you're running a vacuum manually, you're probably a human babysitting it. Uh, whereas if auto vacuum does something in the middle of the night, you probably want it to be a little bit more constricted. Um, also, if you're running a vacuum manually, it probably means that the regular Vac auto vacuum wasn't sufficient, so you probably want to like vacuum harder if that's, if that's the idea. So it's difficult to, to have the auto vacuum variance of these prefs be a little bit more conservative. Does this part make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, and then in terms of memory, uh, there, is, there are two prefs that are really worth noting. One is the maintenance work mem, which is uh, how much memory are you allowed to use in a maintenance operation? So that's a vacuum, an index creation, uh, foreign key creation, a couple other things. And then there's an auto vacuum work mem, which is which defaults the maintenance work mem, but you can you can set a more specific limit for auto vacuums. Um, the the way this comes into play is that under the hood, a vacuum is keeping a buffer of things that it's going to mark as no longer visible to anyone, and then. That buffer has a finite size, and when it's full, you have to go through all the indexes and remove all the dead stuff in indexes. Um, so if you have this memory limit be too small, you'll do a bunch of passes through your indexes, which will slow down the whole process a lot. Uh, and then the trade-off on the other end is kind of obvious. It costs more memory to use more memory. Uh, the way I generally tune this, and I don't know a particularly more scientific way, uh, is if you run vacuum verbose, it'll just tell you all the operations it's doing. And if you see it's going over the table and the indexes a bunch of times, like that's, that's how you know that you can get some mileage out of increasing this. If you want to estimate it a little bit more scientifically, each row that it is marking for deletion costs, I think, six bytes. So you can do some napkin math to figure out about how much. If you, if you know from a verbose run how many rows it's deleting, you can sort of do some napkin math to figure out what a safe upper bound is here, where you won't have to do a bunch of different passes. Uh, the trick, the, any other trade-offs are probably a, specific to a workload. Um, and for completeness, I mentioned vacuum points of I.O. Um, you're probably wondering what is a point. Uh, these are the three prefs that determine the costs of those things. There's a cost for vacuuming a buffer that was in the buffer cache, and a cost for vacuuming a buffer that wasn't, and a cost for uh, modifying a buffer that was in the cache that we now have to write out because we've dirtied it. Um, 
I'm presenting this for completeness. I've generally never gotten any mileage out of tuning these. From a practical point of view, you probably won't either. Um, the main reason for this is that the, uh, across a run, like in a modern database, you're probably gonna have a cost limit. On, on beefy hardware, you're probably gonna have a cost limit in the thousands or, or certainly much larger than the default. Um, and across many thousands of points, the relative frequencies of these three operations are going to sort of stabilize in a law of large numbers sort of sense. So um, you're really like, when you tune these numbers, you're really more tuning the amount of total IO that gets done because the frequencies of these are roughly stable in a large set. So you're much better off just tuning the total cost points that you're, allowed, that you're willing to spend. If you have some sort of pathological hardware setup where, um, where you know, one of these operations is a thousand times more expensive than another or something like that. I don't even know what that would look like for sure, but uh, if you have some really weird hardware, you might get some mileage out of tuning this, but in general, it's probably not worth um, looking at. And then in terms of tuning advice for the limit and the delay, the general rule of thumb is to use a delay that is like a double digit number of milliseconds and then adjust the cost limit, the, the points as needed. So, um, you generally don't want to set the delay too low because you're going to do a ton of context switching if you're, if it's you know a millisecond or something. And also on a lot of modern or a lot of older OSs, uh, the single-digit millisecond sleeping isn't really that well supported anyway. You might actually be doing uh, 10 seconds or something like that, or 10 milliseconds, I should say. So uh, you want some sort of uh, setting where you're not doing a crazy amount of context switching, but um, but you also don't want that to be way too large because uh, you probably want a stable amount of I.O. being used consistently as opposed to um, a period of really intensive use followed by a long sleep period because you want your performance of other things that use the I.O. to be sort of stable instead of like super up and down uh, all day. So you generally set their, your, uh, your um, delay to 10, somewhere around 10 to 50 milliseconds and kind of leave it and then adjust the cost limit, the points limit, uh, until you're happy with the speed of your vacuums and the amount of IO they're using or something like that. So this basically wraps up the portion of the talk about the IO limiting parts of vacuums. Um, any questions? Cool. Um, next, we're going to talk about the management of frozen XIDs and all the rules and stuff around that. So the first and maybe most important pref to think about in this area is um, the vacuum, the freeze min age. So I mentioned when defining how this stuff works, when we see that a row is really old, for some definition of really old, we can assume that we can, we can mark it as frozen. This is the definition of really old, is how old does something have to be before we freeze it. Um, for a lot of workloads, it makes sense to set this. If you're doing a totally right, like insert only, never update, never delete workload, then it actually is sane for this to be uh, really, really small, because as soon as something is written, it's safe to mark it as frozen. Without, you're not going to do a lot of wasted work. Um, in, in, if, if your rows are changing at all, you probably don't want to set this too low, because you're going to do a lot of wasted work in the sense that you'll mark something as frozen and then soon after that you'll, you'll delete it, you'll delete that row version when you do an update or a delete. So you've done a write that you sort of didn't need to do. Whereas if you set this to be longer, you'll, you'll do that much less often because you'll wait a lot longer before, uh, before doing the, the IO to, to mark something as frozen. Um, and uh, there's a separate sort of, this is a little bit hand wavy, but I think generally when you have a row version that's been around it depends on your workload, but you probably have some sort of power law type thing where um, your rows are much more likely to be updated soon after they were written than if they've been there for a really long time without being, without being modified, if that makes sense. It's obviously the details are specific to your workload, but um, this is a general way to think about it. Um, so the default is generally sane, uh, but depending on your database, you might want to change that a lot. It's going to be anywhere from zero to a billion. Uh, then there's the freeze table age, which determines how long, how often we, we make our vacuums aggressive. So what that means is um, we have this visibility map that I mentioned before, where for each block we store one bit. Uh, one bit says uh, all rows on this block are visible, and the other one says all rows on this block are uh, 
frozen already. And in a regular non-aggressive vacuum, if we see that all bits on the row are visible, we'll skip the block entirely because there's not gonna be any, there can't be any dead rows in there if all of the rows are still visible. Um, but it's still possible to have things in there that we would like to freeze, but we, we generally, like, I think for most people, the issues around vacuum tuning are more around like bloat management and stuff and less around frozen, frozenness management. So it errors on that side for normal vacuum runs. But in an aggressive vacuum run, it's really more a thorough vacuum run, um, we will visit the block unless the frozen bit is set. So we'll, we'll go to every single block where there could possibly be something that we want to freeze and freeze if necessary. So during a non-aggressive typical vacuum run, you can't increase the, uh, that, that horizon, that you can't, you can't increase the min visible transaction somewhere, you're the min transaction ID in use in your table because one of them could be hiding in one of the rows that you opportunistically skipped over. But if you do an aggressive run, you can, you can guaranteedly say that there is, uh, you know, we can increase the, the floor of transactions up to which it's safe to write um, by some amount. So this is how often we make our vacuums aggressive. So uh, if you, uh, it's like every so often your vacuum will just be aggressive if enough transaction have happened. Um, or if you do a vacuum freeze, uh, you can think of that as an aggressive vacuum where also we set the freeze min age to zero. Yeah? Sorry, I missed that. What, what's the actual number of MEs? Oh, uh, the question is, what is two, M is million. So 200 M is 200 million. 150 M is 150 million. Yeah. Oh, transactions. transactions. Yeah. So uh, if, a, if a transaction ID is 200 million transactions old, then we can, we can freeze it. Or if a... If a um, if, a, if it's been 150 million transactions on this table since we last did an aggressive vacuum, we can do an aggressive vacuum. So uh, in a pretty direct sense, the right settings for these depend on each other. Um, the higher your freeze min age, um, the lower you wanna set your freeze table age because uh, if you're waiting a lot longer before freezing something, that means that when you finish an aggressive run, you've bought yourself less headroom. So uh, you, you like are going to need to do more of those to kick the can down the road, the same aggregate amount. Um, this can be anywhere from zero to two billion, although you're playing, playing at YOLO if you have it really close to two billion. Um, and finally, there's an auto vacuum freeze max age, which is, um, so every table is keeping track of its, uh, its oldest XID in use, or its oldest XID anywhere in the table. And uh, the freeze max age is how old does it have to be before auto vacuum will trigger an aggressive vacuum on its own on the table. So uh, you can think of this kind of as how often will, um, will the auto vacuum uh, like run, like check that you're, do a full pass, an aggressive pass. Uh, and then this also silently modifies the other two. Um, the, if you have an auto vacuum freeze max age set, um, it will silently limit your freeze min age to half of that with the sort of thinking that um, if your freeze min age is really close to the max age, then you're sort of doing, like it doesn't really make sense as a configuration because you're doing, uh, you're doing these full passes and not doing a whole lot of like still being really conservative about when you'll actually mark something as frozen, if that makes sense. Or similarly, um, the second pref, the vacuum freeze table age is limited to 95% of the third pref, which is the auto vacuum freeze max age. And if you think that this also sort of makes sense, um, if, if you're like 96% of the way to auto vacuum kicking off a aggressive vacuum on this table and you run a manual vacuum on this table, you probably would prefer that that just be aggressive automatically for you instead of doing a vacuum and then a short while from now in transaction ID time, uh, doing a second pass on the table to do one of these freezing runs. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, this, is, this is fair. So an aggressive vacuum will, um, 
like aggressive is a correct term because it also does, it is more aggressive with regards to other transactions that are operating on the table. Um, and uh, like is much less, like a regular vacuum will release locks often in a very friendly way. So it doesn't generally, it, it doesn't generally block transactions trying to operate on the table. Whereas a aggressive vacuum will much more rarely do so. Yeah. Sure, sure. So uh, I think the correct way to put this is, um, uh, Andrew, yeah, Andrew wraparound equals aggressive plus uh, like lock, lock aggression. Oh no, yeah, this makes sense to be a lot higher. So um, the only reason to not tune the freeze max HB really, to tune, the only reason to not tune that really high that I know of at least, is that um, you have to, for any unfrozen transaction that's in use, you need to store the status of that transaction because when something is reading that row from the table, it needs to check if the XIDs corresponding to the X-min and X-max were committed successfully. So um, that storage has some disk cost. I think it's two bits per transaction. So you're, you have some disk footprint that is two bits times your auto vacuum freeze max age. Uh, the max of which is two billion, which is 512 megs of disk, which you, if you're running a large installation of Postgres, you probably don't care about that much. Um, and otherwise, it's just less often that you need to do this very intensive operation. The only other reason you might not want it to be way too high is if, you, uh, if you're worried it won't finish the vacuum in time and you'll get into some sort of like bad maintenance situation where you're at risk of a, uh, getting close to the wraparound and getting shut down by Postgres or something like that. But generally, the default, I think, here, the default is really conservatively low. Um, yeah, so this is your TLDR. Like, your, for your freeze min age, your default is generally, I think, sane. You probably want to uh, lower it for mostly static data sets, um, it, depending on your update, um, what your update and delete workload looks like. You might want to also increase it. Um, your, free, your auto vacuum freeze max age at the bottom, you probably want that to be at least a billion, potentially higher, assuming that you don't care about a couple hundred megabytes of space. And then your freeze table age, you probably just want to set it to 80 or 90% of the, the auto vacuum one. So, the, um, so you probably only want to be doing uh, aggressive vacuums if you're pretty close to doing one via auto vacuum anyway. So this is about it for things I was going to say about row freezing. If, that makes sense. Any qu question? Yeah, uh, so on this variable there, is the wipe uh, zero degree compression margin on the like the table two? Yeah, you can set these. The question was uh, how global are these? You can set these. Yeah, you can you can set these things per. Um, you can definitely set the freeze min age and freeze table age per, I think, per transaction that you're in, or at least per, 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 um, per session. Um, I think the auto vacuum freeze max age you have to set on DB restart. You might be able to set it. Um, I think that one is global, but. So it's not the table you mentioned, right? Oh, you can modify these things for tables as well. Cool. So this is that's how vacuums work and how they're tuned. This is uh, next. Let's talk about how auto vacuum manages all of these things and and when it triggers them and stuff. So the two main things that are important to tune here are uh, the, the I guess that determine this are the um, the auto vacuum vacuum the scale factor and the threshold. So the scale factor you can think of as what percentage of rows in the table. Uh, our tuples in the table are allowed to be dead based on our statistics before we should trigger an auto vacuum for this table. And then the threshold is some offset so that uh, if the table is really small, for example, for example, if you have a 50 row table and you generally have your prefs so that if a table is 20% dead rows, you wanna 
vacuum it, you don't want it to actually vacuum every, every I don't remember what numbers I used, every 10 rows or every 10 deletions or something like that. This is just some offset in the case of small tables. Uh, but the main thing you probably would tune is the, auto vac the, the scale factor. Um, and then there are equivalents of these for analyzes, which auto vacuum also kicks off analyzes as well when it thinks your table statistics might need updating. So uh, there's an auto vacuum analyze scale factor and an auto vacuum analyze threshold. Same basic deal. Um, so this is sort of the formula for how those work. The scale factor is some multiple on the number of rows, uh, and then there's some offset threshold. And if that's if the number of dead rows, if the, if we estimate the number of dead rows in the table be larger than those, then uh, like this table is overdue for being auto vacuumed for bloat. And then um, there's also the auto vacuum. Um, freeze max age that I mentioned a minute ago. That's a separate uh, possible trigger for a vacuum to be run via auto vacuum because you need to deal with the wraparounds. But in terms of bloat, this is your basic world. Uh, and then there's a couple other global things like uh, the max workers, which is how many auto vacuums are we allowed to run at a time. It's reasonably self-explanatory. There's also this nap time, which is how long should we wait between starting new auto vacuum jobs or, or between passes through the, the table space. The default is a minute, which I think is actually really conservative, but it depends on your, your workload. Um, the max workers is probably one that you'll tune at some point. The nap time depends if you have like a really weird lo workload like we have, maybe you'll change it, but you probably don't need to. You care about that so you don't get like a sudden flood of vacuums that start all at once, basically. Um, so if you put all those together, this is sort of the pseudocode for um, what auto vacuum is doing. You, uh, you wait until there's an open slot and you're under your max workers. Um, you check if there's any table that, uh, where, where it has XIDs that are close to the auto vacuum freeze max age limit. And if so, you vacuum in to prevent wraparound in this aggressive mode. Um, otherwise, if there's a table where that formula I showed you was true, then this table is overdue for a regular vacuum, and we'll trigger, we'll do one of those. Uh, and then there should be an equivalent block there for analyzes. That I, it was enough code here already. Um, and then after we've checked all those, we'll sleep for this nap time amount of time. We just continue doing this forever. This is the auto vacuum daemon in a super super reductive nutshell. Um, so uh, a general note on tuning um, is that the solution to most, most auto vacuum related issues and certainly all the ones I've ever seen uh, is that you wanna be vacuuming more, not less. Um, that's especially true now that you have that second bit in the visibility map where uh, like freezes are, like you, you save work from previous aggressive runs. Um, it, it basically, uh, you really want your vacuums, in most cases you want your vacuums to be doing, to be frequent and low impact instead of occasional and very high impact. Um, and people's instinctual reaction is usually not this way. Like they'll have a database where a lot of auto vacuums are going and they'll be confused. Um, and they'll ask, how do I turn this off or how do I turn it down? Uh, which I think is, is equivalent to like when you're pulling an all-nighter trying to figure out how to get more coffee, whereas the real solution is like don't do all-nighters. It's like study sooner or break it up into smaller things, that kind of thing. That's my lame analogy. So this is your philosophy. Um, I'll give you a brief case study on, on a case we had at Heap that was, uh, I think, the worst case scenario I've ever seen for vacuums. So to give you a very brief um, overview, we make a web and iOS analytics tool uh, where the basic premise is that instead of logging things that you want to track, you, uh, we capture everything that happens that your users ever do, every click, every page view, every form submission, swipe, tap, whatever. And then when you want to analyze something, we already have all the data and you can ask your question and get a retroactive answer. So it's an enormous volume of data. Um, at one point in a, in a brief dark time, um, our schema for answering those kinds of questions looked like this. Uh, and all problems start with a schema. And uh, if you're super interested in this stuff, I'm giving a talk tomorrow called Designing the Right Schema for Heap, that will, for which this is like sort of one way not to do it. Um, so your TLDR for this, this, how it used to work is you, every user has a, an ID and belongs to some customer. There's some properties you can tag users with, and there's this big array of JSON blobs which represent all of the events that user has ever done. Um, and then 
So knowing what you know already about MPCC, um, this is a, a, a nightmare in terms of bloat. Every time you append an event that a new user does that comes to that, uh, every time you append an event to that array, you're rewriting the whole row. There's no appending actually happening. You're, you're rewriting the entire row every time. And when we first rolled this out, the users weren't generally that big, but we started to get bigger customers and they had more active users and stuff. Eventually you start getting users with a million events and that means you know a million times you rewrote all the activity that the user did and you had some quadratic amount of cost over time and it's generally a lot of pain. But you're creating a ridiculous amount of bloat all the time. Uh, and then there's 10,000 tables that look like this per DB because it's sharded. Um, so the bloat is crazy. This is over this, I don't know if you can see the numbers, this is over the course of one week. Um, that's a 3.2 terabyte machine. So in the span of about eight, an eight hour workday, you would get like 500 gigs of bloat. Um, so that, that's your bloat part. And then that's Friday night where we just vacuum fold all of the shards and like took a bunch of downtime and this happened a lot. Um, so this is like a worst case, like how do we, basically our strategy is how do we turn vacuum up to 11? Like how do we, make it so that the, the least of, of, so that this graph is happening as little as possible. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of checks you can do here. Um, I'll give you a basic sort of decision tree of how we thought about it. Um, first, you wanna check that this is actually bloat, not data coming in, it clearly is because the vacuum full brings the space back down, so your, your data set size is definitely not growing that fast. Then you probably wanna check if you have spare I.O., in which case you might want to make the vacuums more aggressive so they get more stuff done. So you can increase the cost limit and decrease that cost delay and go lower than I said to go because uh, I didn't know better. Um, this didn't do anything. Then you might want to say, um, does auto vacuum think table should be vacuumed? Like if you, if you play with the table stats and, run, and, and uh, compute the formula that auto vacuum uses to determine if these things should be vacuumed. Uh, you find out, yes, there are a lot of tables that it thinks should be vacuumed. So it's not a question of bad table stats. It's not a question of bad prefs. Um, a bunch of these tables are 10x bloated or worse. So we don't need to change the scale factor or something like that. It, it's already aggressive enough. Um, then you want to see maybe like our vacuums happening at all. Uh, and we looked and they basically were never happening. Like whenever we checked, there were maybe one running. So we definitely aren't resource limited. Um, so we were thinking maybe we'll just do more vacuums at a time. Like let's increase the max workers from the default of three to 25 at a time so that we, at any given time we're doing bloat prevention on more tables. Um, and this didn't really do very much either. And uh, you might have figured out already what the, the last thing you can check is. Um, you, you know, you increase this thing to 25, you're still not seeing more vacuums, you check the logs, you're not actually doing any more of them than you were before. Um, the issue is that you won't start more than one vacuum per nap time. So if the default there is 60 seconds, that's way too low for the context, or way too high, I should say, for the context that we're in. Because you have many shards with many small tables, and the vacuums of each of those takes like 30 seconds or 15 seconds. So at any given time, you only have one or zero of these things running, because by the time you're ready to kick off another auto vacuum process, the previous one probably finished or is close to finishing, so they're not building up. Um, so as you, de you decrease that from you know, 60 to 10 or maybe one second, then you sort of see these things accrue and at any given time you're using an enormous amount of IO to do the vacuums and um, now you have a new problem which is all of your IO is going to vacuums just to keep from bloat happening and uh, if you're curious how the rest of this story goes, um, there's a whole talk on like real fundamental solutions to this problem that I'm giving tomorrow. Um, so that's basic, that's it. So if you have any questions, I think I have one minute. Otherwise you can hit me up on Twitter. Also, there's a GitHub repo with a bunch of specific queries for the sorts of diagnostics I mentioned a moment ago, like how many tables are in the backlog or how close are we to the XID wraparound point or all that, that kind of stuff. Any questions? Cool. Oh, one. The default's good enough for what? Your SSD deployments. Um, I think these things are generally, the question was, are the defaults good for SSD deployments? Um, I think the way that would be most, most directly out of whack is those, co those relative costs, but as I mentioned, I don't think that generally matters. I think you probably wanna make things more aggressive because the, the defaults are set for, you know, like 2002 when you have these spinny disks and slow seeks and like no IO to spare. You probably have a lot more I.O. to dedicate to this. Um, 
yeah, I would, I would uh, keep cranking the auto vacuum up until, uh, until you reach a point where that's no longer practical or you no longer have a reason to do it. Yeah. This is as of 9.6, all this information. In particular, that, that freeze bit. Cool, if you have any other questions, grab me, I'll be over there. Thanks. <laughs>